Okay, so uh, just a reminder, the um, next exam, the second exam, runs the second half of this week, also Wednesday through Friday, and it covers materials up through this lecture, and I should say this lecture is not going to be the full part of today, so hopefully I'll get through all this, and I'll tell you when well, we're switching over to PowerPoint, that'll be the subtle sign. And that new material, I'll start with the new PowerPoint and stuff, that'll be on the final, but not on the second exam. All right, the review sheet, by the way, went up last week. So hopefully uh, you've been able to look at that. Also, I know some of you have begun to go downtown to do the Smithsonian project, so great. Just a reminder that that's coming up. All right, so we've been looking at the history of the dinosaur groups but we've been doing it in the context of phylogenetics. So going up each of the different branches and seeing the diversification up there and the major adaptations and so forth, and a certain amount of the ecology of those animals. But specifically, what we were looking at in those previous cases, in the last several weeks, uh, are what's called ot ecology, or you know, the functional ecology, the ecology of the organisms themselves. But there's another way to look at ecology. And I brought this up when I introduced ecology way back um, in the first section of the course. And that's what's called community ecology, or sometimes sin ecology. So together, sin is together. And these are the interactions between the various species in a community. So rather than the ecology of, say, um, Allosaurus fragilis, but instead the ecology of the Morrison formation dinosaurs and the associated organisms. So, or here in this case, the Hell Creek formation, where we've got the interaction between producers, so there's, there's a, the plants getting their energy from sunlight, feeding the herbivores, and the herbivores feeding the second order consumers, that is the carnivores, in various relationships here. And then down here are decomposers. So, the, when we're talking about community ecology, sort of our fundamental unit, oh shoot, I forgot to take out transitions, okay. Uh, <laughs> and it's gonna be different, it's gonna be random, so who knows what it'll be next time. Um, the, the, what we're looking at are what we call faunas, or flora. So when you talk to a, an ecologist, a fauna uh, is the assemblage of animals in a given region, uh, the flora is the assemblage of plants in a given region, collectively, we can think of them as the ecosystem. And that region might be incredibly small, or it could be some huge, broad example. Um, but what we're interested really here is paleofaunas and paleofloras. It's the same thing, but with an aspect that my colleagues in this building typically don't have to worry about, and that's stratigraphy. Because the uh, assemblages change over time. So this figure over here is looking at latest Jurassic through Cretaceous dinosaurian faunas of Utah. And each of these set of silhouettes represents a different paleofauna, a different assemblage that lived at different moments in history. Typically, we think about the fauna within a formation. Ah, and that's a slide I forgot to put in here. Um, although really, most formations that are referring to these geological units, they often extend for longer than one fauna would exist. Uh, in terms of uh, duration. So if you've got a really well sampled uh, fauna, uh, uh, sorry, formation where you've got a lot of sediment coming in, you can really understand the intervals of time within it, you can actually trace changes of fauna through one formation. So for instance, you know, we see the Morrison formation at the base here, but in fact, there are a bunch of separate paleofaunas in there, similar to each other, yes but separate, because that formation took millions of years to deposit. Now, one big aspect that comes out of modern uh, ecology, modern community ecology, is the recognition of you know, biogeography, that different parts of the world have different characteristic sets of organisms. So biogeography itself is the study of the distribution of organisms by region and the factors controlling that distribution. And so here you see is one set of faunal realms in the modern world. And so you have the animals and plants, as it turns out, of course, of Madagascar are radically different than those in the um, sub-Saharan part of Africa, which is geographically their closest region. 
uh, and the organisms of Africa south of the Sahara are rather different than those of the northern part of the Sahara, and so on and so forth. And we have paleobiogeography as well. And that is the same thing, the distribution of organisms by region and the factors that control that. Uh, but that looks at it over geologic time. And on geologic time, there are changes to the physical geography and in terms of the climate that modern biogeographers don't have to worry about. For instance, the rise and fall of sea levels. OK, we have to worry about that a little bit, but that's on the scale of meters, not hundreds of meters like we see in the geologic record. Or the actual motion of the continents. Yes, the continents are still moving, but at the rate of a fingernail. And so the biogeography that was around you know, in the 1700s is pretty much what we see today, uh, whereas the biogeography of 170 million years ago could be radically different than the biogeography of, of you know, 100 million years ago. And the climates are changing throughout that time, and so on and so forth. Let's see, there we go. Uh, one of the big pictures, though, we see is a difference of world in terms of whether it's cosmopolitan or provincialized. And this is not some sort of commentary on the worldly sophistication of the faunas. Um, so in this case, cosmopolitan means that there's a similar faunal composition across the world. And we typically get cosmopolitan faunas when the continents are closely associated with the, each other. They're joined together. So not surprisingly, we go back in the Triassic. You know, the, the continents have assembled into Pangaea. And so although there are regional differences controlled by climate and controlled by previous history, there's a lot less differences between the faunas from one region to another versus, say, the modern world, which is highly provincialized. So to be provincialized, different regions have different faunas. And this results mostly from the sort of first order level is the physical separ separation of continents. And that gives the creatures that inhabit each landmass time to differentiate from each other to the, the regional extinctions and regional origins and so forth. So you, know, you all know that the animals and plants of Australia are radically different from those of, say, India, which are radically different from those of the American Midwest and so on and so forth. Now, on the broadest level, we see that dinosaurian history, even though the continents themselves are breaking up throughout much of this interval, is largely cosmopolitan in its first, uh, first section and then becomes a lot more provincial in the late Cretaceous. So we go to the late, late Triassic and the, throughout the Triassic, the world is joined in one place and not surprisingly very similar faunas from region to region. But, you know, we move up to the early Jurassic, still pretty similar, whether we're in China or Arizona or um, Argentina. And honest to goodness, although there's still, the world is more physically separated in the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, there's still a lot of similarities in different parts of the world. But when we get to the late Cretaceous, it's highly provincialized. Okay, so we're going to now work our way through dinosaur history and take a look at the characteristics of each time slice, mostly the sort of organisms that are living with each other, but maybe some other comments about what's going on. Now, we do not have a perfectly good 100% record from each region at each time slice, because ultimately we're at the mercy of D-World. Remember, we only get fossils in D-World in the world of deposition, and that itself is controlled by plate tectonics. In order to get fossils, we need a spot where there's both active uplift going on, because that's going to generate new sediment, and a depositional basin into which that new sediment can accumulate, and as it's accumulating, bury the fossils of the animals and plants. So plate tectonics itself is not only uh, changing the distribution of organisms, it's providing the record itself in a fashion. So let's start at the beginning, the mid and late, the middle and late Triassic, the dawn of the age of dinosaurs. At this point, the world is a single place. There is basically just Pangaea. 
And other than climate controls, there's not too many barriers of organisms to spread around the world. And so consequently, organisms in different regions are, are still pretty similar to each other. And at this point, remember, this is back when dinosaurs were a minor part of the faunal assemblage. Remember when I talked about the Triassic diversifications, the Pseudosuchian archosaurs, the protocrocs, are ecologically and morphologically the more common form, uh, they're more diverse, and the therapsids are still doing fairly well. And we get the first dinosaurs, but they're not particularly common, especially early on. So these are some of the earliest dinosaurs, a Herrerasaurus, a Herrerasaur, that group of Triassic carnivorous dinosaurs that don't actually seem to be theropods, and basal sauropodomorphs, like little Eoraptor there. And as we go through the Triassic, we do get more diversification. So the, this sort of oddly shaped figure, but they did, this, they did it this way so they could fill up the space on the page better. So these are the first batch of dinosaurs in what's called the Carnian stage. Then we get to the next stage, the Norian, and there's a lot more forms. We see that they're all to scale. They're getting bigger. And most of this diversification is happening among the um, larger prosauropods and earliest sauropods. So prosauropods, near sauropods, earliest sauropods. And so that's what we see when we get into the true late Triassic. This is, again, when dinosaurs shared the Earth. Theropods are present, but relatively rare, not a major part of the predatory community. Ornithischians may be present if Pisanosaurus is indeed an ornithischian, which I've I think the latest evidence is good that it is, but they're otherwise pretty rare. So we're kind of more still doing pretty well. So here we go, coelophysoids, like coelophysis, these long, gracile predators. Core prosauropods, remember, still obligate uh, quadrupeds. Near sauropods becoming facultative, sorry, obligate bipeds for the core prosauropods, and facultative bipeds and quadrupeds among the near sauropods but a world dominated by Pseudosuchian predators and Pseudosuchian herbivores and so forth. So here we have some um, uh, Ramosuchian, so the, the, the apex predators at the time. Here's an Aedosaur, which is an armored herbivorous Pseudosuchian. Uh, this is a representation of the communities that existed in the petrified forest before it was petrified. And yeah, there's some dinosaurs here. There's Coelophysis and Coelophysoid. Um, and there are some silosaurids, so dinosaur cousins, but a lot of this diversity is Pseudosuchians. Even up to the very end, when we got you know, true, the first true sauropods, they're not getting attacked by theropod dinosaurs, they're getting attacked by the largest Pseudosuchian predators. But then, something big happens. It's not lightning, though, it's volcanoes. I talked about this before. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province erupts as Pangaea begins to tear itself apart. And the world of the late Triassic ends, and we move to the early Jurassic, when dinosaurs actually do inherit the Earth. But at this time, it's still largely Pangaea. And not surprisingly, the dinosaurs we find in you know, South Africa and the American Mid, uh, the American Southwest and China are still pretty similar to each other, very similar dinosaurs in all these regions, in Antarctica and so forth. So this is when the Dilophosaur grade shows up. Remember, these are these next phase of theropods. They don't form a clade, any, well, as far as we know, it's going to be a grade of organization, larger theropods beginning to become common. Coroprosauropods, nearsauropods, very common. This is part of their heyday. And the Ornithischians begin to pop up more and more into the record, including things like Skeletosaurus here, a basal thyreophrin. And so here we have a giant uh, near sauropod. And we actually do have evidence of pretty big theropods at this time. In fact, the evidence, the evidence of the biggest theropods at the time are not their bones, it's their footprints. So here's some footprints from South Africa. And scaling up, this is an animal comparable in size to some of the later Averostrans, some of the things like the Carnosaurs or Megalosaurids. Um, we're hoping someday to find the bones of these animals. 
And then you switch out of this phase when the dinosaurs have inherited, but basically they haven't had a lot of new innovations. And through the crucible of the early uh, Jurassic and competition with each other, we get to the late Jurassic, the middle of late Jurassic, and this is sort of the dinosaurian golden age. This is when we got a huge diversification of forms at all body sizes. Um, during the late Jurassic, we have some really spectacular formations, so we know so a lot of the diversity here. For instance, at uh, the American West, where we've got the Morrison Formation, Dinosaur National Monument, uh, shown here, this watering hole in which the bones of dozens of dinosaurs of uh, more than a dozen species are represented. And it's not alone. We can go to China and East Africa and elsewhere and find similar assemblages of dinosaurs. So this is, that was China. This is northern. Uh, this is North America. This is uh, East Africa. And there are some regional differences, but not tremendously. It's largely similar features. So what do we have? We have this huge diversity among theropods. So the apex predators, the ones at the top of the food chain, are typically Allosauroid carnosaurs and megalosauroids, uh, like this megalosaurid Torvosaurus. This is for the Morris information shown here, actually. Uh, then sort of mid-sized forms, like ceratosaurs, and smaller for, uh, forms, like the early basal solurosaurs, like the early tyrannosauroids. And even by this point, in this massive diversification, we've diversified the solurosaurs up enough that we've actually got aviale present. We've got the earliest members of the lineage closer to modern birds than to Deinonychus. And there's some other groups. There are some non-carnivorous theropods that are showing up at this point, the elaphrosaurines. And the herbivores, this is the greatest time of um, sauropod diversity. And you can have living side by side, you know, one or more species of brachiosaurid and many species of diplodocoid and some basal macronarians, uh, and in different parts of the world, it might be a different, slightly different mix. Um, so a huge diversification of the long-necked plant eaters, but they're not alone. You've got various, and here's basal orthopods, like an iguanodontian, and a more, well, they're both iguanodontian, so it's, um, Caposaurus, a larger one, Dryosaurus, a small one, Stegosaurus, this is the Stegosaurian heyday. So, the most common herbivores at the time, those sauropods, second most common stegosaurs. Other ornithischians present, but less common. Then, by the time we get to the early part of the early Cretaceous, there is much more separation between the land masses. As the central Atlantic region is growing, it separates out the southern continents from the northern continents. So the northern continents collectively are called Laurasia. And uh, that's North America, Greenland, Europe, and Asia, so Laurasia. And the southern continents collectively are Gondwana, which is actually a term that goes to uh, really old uh, bio uh, uh, geography and biogeography studies in the history of, uh, of geology. So the southern continents are South America, Africa, Madagascar and India, and Madagascar has had a long history shared with India rather than Africa, Antarctica, and Australasia. And as they separate out, they're still, you know, they're getting further apart. There's some regional provincialization going on, but apparently still enough connection that we have a lot of similar creatures in different parts of the world. Now, I say this is the flowering of the age of dinosaurs, and it is in two different ways. One is we get an expression of diversification in some of the groups, so flowering in that sense. But it's also the time that a very odd group of organisms evolves, and those are flowers, flowering plants. So flowering plants, uh, collectively called angiosperms, are today by far the most common type of plant. Now, a flowering plant isn't merely something like a rose or a magnolia or things like that. They can have tiny little flowers as well. They're also the fruiting plants. So any plant that has true fruit or flowers is an angiosperm. Now, the interesting thing, one of the many interesting things about flowers is that they have sex with animals. They don't reproduce 
to produce hybrids with animals, they have sex by means of animals. That's how they have sex with animals. That is, most of them do not get wind pollinated like their ancestors did. Although some do, and they're quite annoying, it's ragweed and so forth. Um, but instead, they're pollinated by means of some form of animal, typically an insect, but they can be some other groups as well, today bats and birds, for instance. And by pollination, that means the transmission of the sex cells. That's what pollination is. So, you know, an insect flies into a flower and gets covered in plant sperm, because that's what pollen is. Gross, I know, but that's what it is. And then it flies off to another flower, and that comes off onto the, uh, the flower, and it fertilizes the female cells. And so they, they reproduce, they transmit the genetics by means of the insects, the pollinators. And then the other attribute of angiosperms is that they grow a special covering around the seeds. And that covering is bitter and hard and unappealing when the seeds are not ready to germinate. But when the seeds are ready to germinate, that covering turns into something that's nice and nutty because nuts are actually fruit or tasty and sweet, like more typical fruit. And that's when the other group comes along, the vertebrates. Because vertebrates are the main animals that eat seeds. And those vertebrates today, it's all sorts of things. Back in the Mesozoic, it could be all sorts of things too, early mammals, lizards and their cousins. But of course, the most common one would be dinosaurs, herbivorous dinosaurs. So they come along, munch on the fruit, walk around some distance, do their business, keep on going, and they've transported the seeds for the plant, and heck, they've given a bunch of fertilizer too. And so between the insects doing their pollination and the spread of seeds by vertebrates, including dinosaurs, the angiosperms become more and more common throughout the Cretaceous. Now, there was a time that um, some authors suggested that dinosaurs in particular were responsible for the origin of the angiosperms. The idea was that this, the, the, the extinction of most of the high browsers, those would be uh, sauropods and stegosaurs, although stegosaurs weren't necessarily habitually rearing up, but they could have done that. And this idea was that they wiped out these forests and so just smaller plants were around and that the action of low browsing animals helped clear out the fields and the angiosperms as well. Well, it turns out sauropods do really well in the Cretaceous. This is sort of a very biased view. Sauropods are doing great. Um, so it's not like the high browsers disappeared. The low browsers do become pretty common. Um, and instead, it looks like the angiosperms were probably going to spread anyway. Dinosaurs certainly helped them and maybe helped support certain types of fruit. Um, and maybe it's the stories the other way around. Maybe the diversification of angiosperms helped the dinosaurs, that is, providing lots of new types of nutrients. Well, let's take a look at the dinosaurs that are around in the early part of the early Cretaceous. Well, if you look at the predators, it's not dramatically different than it was back in the Jurassic. You know, still carnosaurs uh, as one of the major apex groups. Um, within the megalosauroids, the old style disappear, and they're replaced by the spinosaurids. The tyrannosauroids, some of them are getting larger, but they're still not the apex predators. And we got lots and lots and lots of sorts of solarosaurs represented here. We got dromaeosaurids, like Deinonychus, and oviraptorosaurs, so these herbivorous, carnivorous dinosaurs. And the herbivores, and sauropods are still doing well. This is the brachiosaurs and their relatives among the, uh, the early cousins of the titanosaurs are doing super well. And things like the, the smaller diplodocoids, the dicreosaurs and the robotisaurids, the sort of lower ones feeding lower to the ground, they're undergoing a diversification at this time. Oh, it is fair to say that a lot of low browsing forms were diversifying. Ankylosaurs, very abundant at this time. Stegosaurs, increasingly rare. In fact, they disappeared by the end of this time. Early ceratopsians, small ornithopods. And an especially important group here are the Styracosternin iguanodontians, like iguanodon itself. This is when iguanodon was around. They're becoming really common. Now, 
incidentally, this time, the early part of the early Cretaceous, that's towards the end of this part, is when Maryland's best dinosaur fossils formed. So just so you see where Maryland is on the map, there we are. Uh, we were still, um, well, we were coastal. In fact, PG County is the best spot to find dinosaurs uh, from Maryland. In fact, you go up Route 1, you turn right up Conti Road, you turn right into the first uh, development there. It's a um, light industrial park. And there's a little dinosaur site there. It's, it's, it's gated off. It's opened every first and third Saturday if you want to go digging there. Um, you can help them out. The specimens go to the Smithsonian, ultimately. Um, um, although some of them are actually going to be going to some of the Maryland repositories as well. Uh, but there's some research going on there. I was actually just there on Saturday, but unfortunately it was too rainy. It had been too rainy the day before, so everything was saturated. We couldn't do any digging. So the dinosaurs we find there, well, this is what the stuff looks like. It's a clay pit. It used to be mined professionally. It's called the Arundel Formation. Although, to be fair, that might, um, some people regard it as a member of a different formation. That's trivial for this class, so we're not going to deal with that. Um, and what fossils are found there? Well, our state dinosaur is found there. Now, granted, every state has a state dinosaur in the form of the state bird, but some states additionally have a state fossil or a state dinosaur. We have both. Our state fossil is a uh, snail, a sea snail from the mid Cenozoic, and our state dinosaur is Astrodon johnstoni, which is a brachiosaurid or close relative of brachiosaurids. Um, and this is a restoration of the environment. In the Arundel, we've got brachiosaurs, we've got uh, dromaeosaurs, we've got ornithomimosaurs, um, we have ankylosaurs. We have maybe primitive tyrannosauroids, um, and we've got iguanodontians, um, and then a lot of animals that aren't dinosaurs because, you know, it's not just a world of dinosaurs, and then lots and lots and lots of plants as well. Oh, also, we got, we got a, a, a big uh, theropod as well. When we get to the late part of the early Cretaceous, and the early part of the late Cretaceous, what should be a mid-Cretaceous if stratigraphy were, uh, were better, but it isn't. Uh, <laughs> we get the hottest times in the Mesozoic. In fact, the hottest times in like the last half million years or so. That was for extended periods of time. Sorry, half billion years. Without me. Um, this is because the separation of Laurasia from Gondwana was sufficient it allowed for something which is weird in Earth history, and that is a circumequatorial current. Normally, at least one hemisphere has some land mass that breaks, the breaks across the equatorial region. And so water can't stay circulating near the equator. Why is that important? Well, when water has to, you know, it's been around the equator, it gets, it gets warm, duh. But then it gets deflected north or south, and it dumps its heat and it cools down. But what if some of the water could stay in the circumequatorial region again and again and again? Just keep on circulating there. Well, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It also gets saltier and saltier and saltier, because that water is evaporating. And so it's leaving behind salt. Salt doesn't evaporate. It stays behind. And so we have this band of really warm, salty water. Well, salty water is denser than less salty water. And so that then plunges down to the seafloor, the bottom of the ocean. And so we have this layer now of really hot, salty water. It spreads north and south, because those are the only directions it can go. And it warms everything above it. And so it makes the oceans overall warmer, which means the atmosphere stays warmer. Additionally, as we all know, uh, the warmer a liquid gets, the less dissolved gases it has in there. It goes flat. Uh, think of whatever carbonated beverage uh, you're interested in, and the, least, the warmer it is, the less carbonated it is. Same thing happens to the ocean. What's carbonation? It's CO2. So CO2 comes out of the ocean, stays in the atmosphere, and CO2, of course, is a greenhouse gas. So the world gets particularly warm during this interval. And it winds up being a peak in terms of CO2, 
It might be a peak of oxygen that's actually less certain. It definitely is a peak for high sea level and for high temperatures. Certain types of organisms like that. And so there's some people who have suggested that the conditions favor the growth of plants, at least the plants that lived at that time, to such a degree that there's basically the base of the food chain is bigger than it's been for a while and can support more biomass above it. One thing that's definitely true is that during this interval in the equatorial regions, we find many dinosaurs with fins or sails on the body in different groups. We have ornithopods, we have sauropods and orbachisaurids, and of course theropods, especially in the form of spinosaurids, get these really tall sails. One suggestion is that these equatorial dinosaurs were evolving that to dump heat from the body so they don't overheat in the really hot times there. And so there's an outdated picture of Spinosaurus with its big, big sail. So taking a look at some of the common predators from this time. So Carcharodontosaurids, so these advanced carnosaurs, are the apex predators for uh, most of the world at the time, back to all the whole world at the time. Spinosaurids are pretty common during these hot times. This is when Spinosaurus itself lives. Curiously, we don't find any Spinosaurids at all. I mentioned before, in North America. We should. Like the Arundel, that time just before this, should have had them. It's the right environment for them. We haven't found any other teeth yet or anything. And then various other sorts of animals. And these people for the southern continents. We've got you know, Noah saurines, uh, those weird forward pointing, very gracile forms, Bahariasaurids, these bizarre creatures whose identity is still not really known. Uh, the main herbivores in most parts of the world are titanosaurs and some variety of Styracosternin ornithopod. So, in fact, this is the time interval in which the very largest dinosaurs show up. The biggest titanosaurs are most common during these, this interval. Now, in North America, during this interval, we have an interesting um, transition. And that is some groups which were already present in Asia begin to spread into Western North America over what's now the Bering Straits. So this is Siberia. This is Alaska. This area is above sea some of the time and below sea some of the other time. And these groups that seem to come over or that are shared between the two of them Ankylosaurines, club-tailed ankylosaurids. The advanced frilled Neoceratopsians. There were earlier ones that were over here. Now we're getting the big ones, the great big frills. Pachycephalosaurs, maybe remember that pachycephalosaur origins remain a mystery. Advanced tyrannosauroids. The ornithomimids, the toothless members of the ornithomimosaurs and maybe some other groups of Solorosaurs, and possibly hadrosaurid ancestors are coming over into North America. Although, it might be the other way around with hadrosaurids. They may have, sort of, the hadrosaurid ancestors may have started over here and made their way to Asia. It, it sort of, they look like they're exchanging back and forth a lot. And so you can go towards the end of this interval to the American Southwest. And although these aren't any of the days, so they're not members of the later group that ended in day. This is a Tyrannosaur, near to Tyrannosauridae, but not in Tyrannosauridae. These are Ceratopsians, not quite Ceratopsids, but close. And that is a Hadrosauroid, but not quite a Hadrosaurid. So these are all like just right before they transition over. And so we see this, they're all from this interval right here that represents the separation from the sort of mid-Cretaceous assemblage to the typical late Cretaceous assemblage. Unfortunately, as it points out, dinosaur fauna is rare. During that interval, we actually do a very, very few sites where we've got good fossils for just sad reasons. I mean, the, 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 the tectonics wasn't favorable for it at the time. And then we get to the late part of the late Cretaceous, sort of the peak 
of dinosaur provincialism, and I think you can see why. The continents are really spread apart. Sea level is very high still for most of this, and different regions have different sorts. There's some uh, draining of the seas at the very end. We'll talk about that when we talk about the extinction, but still, the different regions are highly separated. And this is our interval of time, these last two stages of the late Cretaceous where we actually have the best dinosaur fossil record around the world. It's not even by any means, but it is excellent. And it's not just the dinosaurs that are separated up. It's mammals, it's amphibians, it's even the plants. So this shows different types of pollen in different regions. And in fact, they often match the different types of dinosaurs that are in different regions. So let's go region by region. The best studied the best understood of all of these, along with the greatest sample, is what we call Laramidia, or Western North America. Western and Eastern North America are separated by a shallow seaway. And this Laramidian assemblage is a super familiar one because we have so many good fossils. So this is a look at North America at the time. And yeah, as I've mentioned this before, at the time, you could have taken a boat from what's the, now the Gulf of Mexico over Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, the Prairie Provinces, all the way to the Arctic Ocean, and never see land. And it separates the Laramidian side from the Appalachian side. And in Laramidia, we have, finally, the true Hadrosauridae, the true Ornithomimidae, the true Tyrannosauridae the true Ceratopsidae, and Kylosauridae, Pachycephalosauria. In the case of the guys over here, it's not quite certain which direction they came from. It might have been from Asia to North America. They might have been North America to Asia. These groups down here almost certainly are Asia to North America because the basal branches are all in Asia. Ceratopsids. They're almost only found in North America anyway. They look like a local group. So this assemblage of dinosaurs is very characteristic for, for Laramidia, very well understood. And it's, as we will see as we continue to go through the course, a lot of our understanding of dinosaur biology comes from these forms. Now, because we don't have an actively building landmass in Eastern North America, and actually building mountain range, there's not a lot of, uh, of uplift, so not a lot of sediments forming. And on top of it, it's a lot greener out here, a lot, of, a lot less exposure. But we do have evidence of dryptosaurids and other primitive tyrannosaurs. We've got primitive hadrosaurs. We have some, you know, as you see down there, we've got some ankylosaurs and so forth. But in general, they seem to be earlier diverging groups that we see in Laramidia. <coughs> So there's Asia America with its characteristic fauna. And it is an Asia America because many of these groups are found in both regions. And you go over to continental Asia, if you find deposits where there's a lot of water, where there's streams and so forth, it's basically the same critters that we have in Laramidia. But because uh, Asia is a larger landmass at the time, it also had some big deserts. And this is our best knowledge of desert dinosaurs. And not surprisingly, the dinosaurs of the deserts are much smaller. Uh, a community with very fewer plants can't support a lot of big animals. This is where Velociraptor is from. This is where Protoceratops is from. The largest dinosaur in continental Asia in the deserts is an ankylosaur, and it's not even a particularly big one. And that's just because it's a tougher environment to live in. Europe is, as it's been throughout most of the Cretaceous, an archipelago, for that matter, even Lake Jurassic. So it's a bunch of, it looks something like Indonesia might look today, both in terms of being tropical, but also a bunch of islands of various sizes. And it's got its own batch of primitive hadrosaurs, and its own radiation of unique forms of ornithopod, and various unique forms of silurosaur, and various unique forms of ankylosaur, uh, with a couple elements coming in from the south. And recently recognized, there's some, some creatures from Europe 
heading cell. So there's a look at the European archipelago at a couple different time slices. Uh, it turns out that the only known so far hadrosaurid found in Africa is specifically from Europe. So it's a newly discovered formation from the very, very end of the Cretaceous. Only one bit of it has been described so far, this hadrosaur. Um, and it falls, it's the one here in blue, it falls within a clade of otherwise uniquely European or at least Eurasian hadrosaurids. So it looks like it migrated from Europe into northern Africa. And then the rest of Gondwana, so the southern continents. This has its own batch of characteristic organisms. There are bellysaurs. There are a few of bellysaurs that make their way up into, uh, into Europe. But their, their main concentration, this group of, of stump-armed ceratosaurs, the major apex predators for most of Gondwana. In the southern parts of Gondwana, the megaraptorans, these mysterious long-snouted possible tyrannosaurs are around. There's some other sorts of silurosaurs there. And then by far the most common herbivore are not ornithischians, it's titanosaurs. So titanosaurs sauropods, by far the most common. There are some other, there's some ornithischians there, but they tend to be pretty rare. And so it's another fauna, in this case one with a megaraptor in, in it. And so this is a look at the distribution of the bailisaurids. And you see there are some up there in Europe, that's four, but otherwise they're all over the Gondwanan regions. And so, as I said, here's sort of the creatures, the theropods of Gondwana, that I already mentioned them before, and dominated by titanosaurs. And that's the nature of the world when the great impact occurred 66 million years ago. But that story is what we'll pick up later on at the, at the end of the course. But now I'm going to say a little bit about trace fossils. So this will actually segue directly into Wednesday's lecture. So most of the work we've been doing with the SPRACs has necessarily looked at the body fossils. Because body fossils tell us about most aspects of the biology, especially with regard to, say, phylogenetics and changing adaptations and so forth. But trace fossils are pretty important, too. And the study of trace fossils is called ichnology. Ichnite, or ichnos itself, is Greek for trace. And ichnite is another name for a trace fossil. And in the case of dinosaur studies, some of our most important type of trace fossils are trackways, that is, series of footprints, because they tell us a lot about the locomotion. Now, a curious feature of ichnology is that it has its own set of names, which are structured like genus and species names, uh, called ichnotaxonomy. But these are not names of species. They're not names of biological sets of organisms. They're names for the footprints, or the bite marks, or what have you. And they're totally separate. They are distinct from, and, and they're totally distinct from the species that made them. In fact, if two dinosaurs have the same foot, same style foot, even if they're different groups of dinosaurs, they would produce the same ichnotaxon, because the footprint would look the same, and that's what's getting named there. It's weird. If I, were, if I were in charge of things, it's not how I would have done it, but it's been a tradition since the 1700s, so we're stuck with it. So here we see two different species, quote unquote, of eubrontes. Uh, but in fact, it almost certainly is just a younger and older individual of the same species, but because they're different in terms of the footprint shape, they're given different names. It's weird, but that's the way of things. Now, in general, we can pin down the organism, the, the group of organism that made the tracks pretty well. Not always, but generally pretty well. We can recognize what one it is, because we know that the number of fingers and the relative proportions of the fingers and toes and the size of the hand and the feet and so forth. But it's not quite as good as, um, as like a field guide to mammals you might get, which you can see a footprint, oh, that's a gray squirrel or whatever. Um, for one thing, we typically don't know all the, the body fossils that lived 
in a particular formation. We're still getting new ones all the time, and therefore, when we find a track, it might be a member of a group, but we haven't found that species yet. And, you know, sometimes creatures might have very similar tracks, even if they are not so closely related. So they don't come like this with the actual names on here. And uh, these are actually, this cartoon is based on uh, friends of mine, um, the late Ralph Chapman, who used to be at the uh, Smithsonian, and his wife, Linda Deck. And um, they were friends of this cartoonist, and that's why he put that in there. So, footprints. They're pretty cool, but here's something to remember. A footprint is a 4D object, or rather it is a 3D representation of a 4D event something that took place over three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Because it's a record of the movement. It isn't simply a cookie cutter imprint of the bottom of the shape of the foot. It involves the interaction of that foot and the sediment through time. And so, in most cases, you can't just look at a footprint and that tells you exactly the shape of the foot of the animal. Sometimes the sediment might be goopy, technical term, and therefore the footprint might look different, or as we see here, if the sediment was deep and the foot sits in it and then it rotates through, it produces shapes which you couldn't actually see on the, the foot itself. So here, for instance, was a semi-goopy um, sediment, now it's underneath the river, so there's new water on top of it, of the footprint of what's probably the Carcharodontosaur acrocanthosaurus. And that's probably from the same species and possibly from the same individual. But that particular spot was a little goopier at the time, and so when the foot pulled out, some of the sediment slumped back in. So this was not a duck footed dinosaur here. And I think you can even see a bit of trace of the longer toes that were there originally. Nevertheless, Footprints are great for increasing our knowledge of the diversity that might live in a particular region at a particular time. Because the animals are walking around, they don't need to die to leave their track, and they, there's the chance that an animal leaves a trackway, but doesn't necessarily leave a body fossil. It's not one that's been discovered yet. So in this diagram, the fossils in red, I guess the fossils in red represent species whose record for those time slices in the communities in Australia are known only from footprints. We don't have their body fossils yet. So that's pretty good. They help ex they'll expand our knowledge of the ancient diversity. In some cases, they show us the largest dinosaurs at that time. I showed you earlier the giant theropod from southern Africa in the early Jurassic. Here is a giant sauropod track. Or rather, to be fair, it's two prints. That's the hand, that's the, the toe, the, the foot. So it's not like the single foot was as big as this man. That's still a big ass dinosaur. <laughs> Trackways themselves, and I'll end uh, with this one, because we'll pick it up next time. Trackways are helpful because they are a record of the dinosaur while moving. So a trackway is a succession of footprints. And it turns out that we can actually use some relatively simple math to help reconstruct how fast an animal was going at the time they made the track. So when we come back, we'll begin to use trackway analysis as well as other techniques to begin to think about reconstructing the living dinosaurs and some of their behaviors. And just as it says here simply, and we'll, we'll go over that again, as speed increases, the distance between the tracks, that is the stride length, will also increase because it's covering more, more space with time. All right, so I will see you all on... Let's see.